How many of you have ever played a game on a virtual reality headset? Yeah, same as first hour. I would have thought more people. Not that many have. I'd never done it until very recently. My son got a VR headset for Christmas a year ago, and he brought it back from college uh, over Christmas this year. And I played this game, which, and it's amazing. It's where these mummies are coming after you. And so, I mean, it, you, everywhere you look, there's a mummy, and, and you kick the mummies, you hit the mummies, you shoot the mummies, you throw beer bottles at the mummies as they're coming. And it feels really real because it's virtual reality. And I played several times, and then I convinced Lil to play it. First, she wasn't really excited about it. And when she first put it on, it kind of made her feel weird. And, uh, but then she liked it. I mean, she played several games in a row. And she is kicking and hitting mummies way faster than I did, which if you know both of us, you know exactly why that is. But she was really good, but all of a sudden, we got a scare. She takes off running in our living room, hits a chair, flips over the chair, lands in the floor hard, and fortunately, she wasn't hurt. She was shaken up. But I go over and I'm like, baby, what, what happened? She said, I had to get that mummy. <laughs> it feels real. And so VR games are getting more and more amazing. You can actually now watch an NBA game from center court down in the expensive seats on your VR headset. You pay some money, and it's like you're sitting there with the crowd all around you, and you can see everything as you look around. That's how what it's gotten to with games. See, video games have become pretty amazing. Video games can make us an MMA champion. They can make us a sports hero. They can make us a war hero or an astronaut, all without leaving the comfort of your couch. They can let us save the world while we never get too far away from our favorite soft drink and some nacho cheese Doritos. Look, I know that women play video games. You do. But guys, we play it a lot more and a lot more passionately, and it takes up a whole lot more of our time generally than women. And I don't think Ladies get as caught up in video games where they begin to kind of withdraw and pull out of the reality of real life as men do. And so men, I want to talk directly to you today. Uh, it's too late. You can't get up and leave now. I'm going to see you if you try to leave. But I want to talk directly to you today about what it looks like to be the leaders spiritually in your own home. And ladies, don't be disappointed. I'm going to talk to you some as well. And you may be wondering why I'm doing this at the end of the sermon series on marriage, why I'm wrapping up this way. I'm glad you asked that question. Here's why. Because I believe that if the men of this church stand up and be the spiritual leaders God called us to be, it is going to transform our marriages, it is going to transform our families, and it is going to transform our communities. I believe that's, yeah, that's worth clapping for. I believe that if we do that, we're going to be amazed at what God does. Men, we are called to be heroes. We are called to be spiritual leaders in our home and to lead our families towards Jesus. And I get that it's not always easy. Look, I know it is hard to lead. I actually read a story about a young British sea captain back in the 1700s, uh, you know, the old uh, wooden ships. He was the captain of a frigate in one of the many wars against France, and he is standing on the, the quarter deck up high as they're sailing across the ocean, and he hears the lookout person up high yell, enemy frigate to starboard. And he looks and he sees the frigate in the distance, and so he calmly orders his men to battle stations, and then he looks over at his cabin boy and he says, Bring me my red shirt. Cabin boy looks at him a little weird and takes off to his cabin and comes back with this scarlet red shirt. And before the battle begins, the captain takes off his shirt, puts on this scarlet red shirt. And then when the battle starts, man, this captain is everywhere. He seems to be at every place that the, ba the battle is the heaviest. He never ducks when the, the, the bullets are flying and when the cannonballs are hitting the ship. He leads the charge with his sword and jumps from one ship to the other and leads the charge onto the enemy vessel. And ultimately, the battle was won. Well, that night, they were celebrating this victory, and one of the crewmen said, but Captain, why did you ask for a red shirt? And he said, well, I wanted to encourage you, and if I was injured, I didn't want you to see the blood so that you'd lose your courage and your will to fight. And so at that point, they're even more amazed by the courage and the wisdom of their captain than they were before. Well, a few days later, he's back on the quarterdeck, standing, looking out to sea, and the lookout says, six enemy ships to starboard. And he 
looks and sees the six ships and he says calmly, battle stations. And then he looks over at his cabin boy and he says, bring me my brown pants. <laughs> That's not, not a real war story. Yeah, some of you are just now getting it. It's actually funnier than you thought it was. <laughs> Men, leading is not easy. I get that. Being the spiritual leaders of your home isn't always easy. And sometimes we've got to have a scarlet shirt. And sometimes we need to even have a pair of brown pants handy. And being a hero, being a spiritual leader is way easier in a video game than it is in real life. But I believe that if the men of Kara City will stand up and lead spiritually the way we're called to, God is going to do crazy big things in our families, in our marriages, in our church, and in our community. See, some people think that the American church, what it really needs to thrive is more inspired preaching, but what it really needs is more inspired men who stand up and be the, become the spiritual leaders that set the example for their families of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Some people say that the American church needs more prayer in church, but I believe what we need is more prayer from the men who are in church that is passionate about God doing big things in their marriage and in their families. And that's why we're kicking off our prayer nights on Wednesday night with just the men this Wednesday. I know you're busy. I know you've got a lot going on, but at 6.30, we're going to come and we're going to break fast together. Our staff's committed. We're going to fast all day and we're going to pray throughout the day for God to do stuff. And if you saw my email, fasting is not something we've done as a church before. But we're going to do that. And this week, it's just for the men. You'll see another video about that. You can get it also from my email yesterday. But we want to be a men who lead. All right, well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start at the very beginning of that chapter and look at verses uh, 1 through 12. If you remember, we kicked off this sermon series called Save the Date in Genesis chapter 2, and we're winding up just one chapter later. And the story we're looking at today is where sin enters the world through Adam and Eve when they first eat the, the forbidden fruit. And as you're turning there, I'm going to read you a couple of passages from the New Testament talking about that important moment in human history. This is what Paul says in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. So it, sin and death enters the world through a man. All right, look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22. For since death came through a man, he's talking about Adam here, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, talking about Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so in, cross, so in Christ all will be made alive. You know, I hear that passage of Scripture, and I, and I want to push back a little bit with Paul. I want to kind of defend men everywhere. Like, Adam didn't eat the apple for the fruit first. Eve did. At worst, big old goofy Adam, you know, Eve's like, hey, you want the apple? You know, and he's like, okay. You know, that's at worst. That's the what I want to say is he just kind of followed along when Eve ate the fruit. So why does Paul call out Adam here? Why does he call him out for the first sin? Let's see if we can figure that out as we read this passage of Scripture together. This is verses 1 through 12 in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He's talking about Satan here. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Now, 
There are several things that we're going to learn from Adam here in this passage of Scripture. We're going to be learning from his mistakes. And if we can learn from his mistakes, hopefully we can avoid making some of those same mistakes uh, when we try to lead our own families to Jesus. All right, here's the first thing that we learn from Adam. Don't hide from God. Let's look at what happens here. This is actually pretty cool if you read it. This is verses 8 and 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was watching as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now just imagine this scene. Adam is naked as a jaybird. He is hiding, peeking out from behind a tree. He's hiding from the God of the universe, the God that created everything, that created him. He's playing hide and seek with God. And of course, he loses. But what's amazing is thousands of years later, men are still doing the exact same thing. We, we hide from God. It, you can look around and see the average church attendance in America is made up of 61% women and only 39% men. That's a dramatic difference. Men are called by God to be the spiritual leaders in our own home, and yet we sit on a deer stand or in a sports arena or on a golf course or some other place allowing our wives to take our children to church. We're called to be the spiritual leaders, and yet we abdicate that and don't fulfill our responsibility. And I want to be transparent with you guys. This is an area where I really struggled at one point in my life. You know, I've only been a pastor for about 13 years, and I've been an attorney for about 28 years. Just like Adam, I've known God all my life. I mean, I, I'm the son of a Baptist preacher, so I never knew what it was like to not know Jesus. And when I was a teenager, I was called to preach. That all happened very early. But my wife and I, we had a bad experience in a church in college when I was serving as the, the student pastor. And we decided, you know what? Listen, I did. This is an excuse. I'm going to law school. And so I went to law school instead of seminary. And then when I got out of law school, career became the most important thing to me. My marriage was not that important. God wasn't important. I worked all the time. I traveled all week. I would work most evenings late. I would work into the weekend. My wife wasn't a priority. And I put my work first. And then when Lil and I started having kids... I continued. I continued to hide from God. I wasn't the spiritual leader that I was called to be. We would go to a church with the kids, and I would always find a reason that I didn't like it. You know, Lil would convince me to go, and I'd go try it out, and the, the seats would be too hard or too soft. The preacher would be too loud or too soft. The music would be too loud or too soft or too old. I would always find a reason that we didn't go to church. And, and so I hid from God, and the reality is when I did that, my family followed my lead. When my two oldest were little, they didn't have any relationship to the church. They didn't have any connection to Jesus. See, the problem was I knew how to be a good lawyer. I didn't know how to be a good husband and father. So I just defaulted to what I knew how to do. I won lawsuits instead of turning, trying to learn how to, be, to win in my family. And what I didn't know at that time was that my wife was really praying for me with another couple that she had met through homeschooling. She was praying that, that God would get my attention and that I would become the spiritual leader he called me to be and that she desperately wanted me to be. And so as they prayed, um, God got my attention. <laughs> he gave my wife lupus, and 15 years ago she was diagnosed. And suddenly I went, whoa, this wife that I've taken for granted may not be here forever. And suddenly my priorities began to change. And we began to go back to church and we began to get involved. And when I did that, it changed the trajectory of my marriage. It changed the trajectory of my kids' relationships with Jesus. All four of my kids have now decided to follow Jesus and been baptized. That changed because I changed. But if I'm really transparent with you, there are a couple of my kids that I think would have a stronger faith today if I had led them better early. And that's just being real transparent about where I was. When I did that, I answered the call to preach finally. I joke with my wife that she has to be careful what she prayed for because she was praying desperately for me to be a, a, a leader spiritually. She didn't know that was going to mean that I was going to become a pastor again and we were going to start a church. See, even when I began to lead my family, I, I wasn't perfect. 
I'm still not perfect today. I still struggle sometimes. What does it look like to lead my family towards Jesus? What it, does it look like to be a spiritual leader? But it changed things when I stopped hiding from God. It changed the trajectory. My marriage is awesome now. It wasn't good back then. It has changed things in my life. You know, I wish I could go back and be a better leader for my kids when they were really little. But I can't fix that. I just have to decide to be the best spiritual leader I can be going forward. And some of you guys, you're right where I was. You're hiding from God. You're, you're called to be the leader spiritually of your family, but you're, you're too busy with work or hobbies or different things going on in your life. And so you've kind of abdicated that role. And your wife maybe is trying to lead your family, but she'll never do it the way you could. It will never have the impact that you could have if you did what you were called to do. You have a unique God-called duty to lead your family spiritually. The Bible is so clear about that. But not as the Bible just clear, but modern studies and surveys support what the Bible says. There was this big study that was done in Europe several years ago that looked at the difference between a home where the mom was really committed to church and the dad wasn't, and homes where the dad was really committed to church and the mom wasn't. And, and here's what they found. They found if the mom is really committed to church and the dad isn't, when the kids are grown, only 3% of them stayed very connected to the church. 60% of the kids in a mom-led spiritual home, 60% said they never went to church ever when they left home. But listen at the difference when the dad is the spiritual leader and the mom wasn't. When the dad was very committed to church, and even when the mom didn't go to church at all, 38% of the kids stayed very connected to the church when they left home. That's almost 13 times higher than when it was the opposite and mom was very connected and dad wasn't. Bottom line is this, men, you have a God-given call to lead your families spiritually. That's how God designed it to work. Our kids take our primary view about Jesus and religion and church from us. And, and so the bottom line is, whether we like it or not, whether we lead the right way or not, whether we set a good example or not, we are the spiritual leaders of our home. And, and so the question is, how will we respond? Will you lead your wives and kids to follow after Jesus or will you let your wife just take your kids to church and watch as your family begins to drift away from their faith? Guys, I'm not trying to scare you. Actually, I am trying to scare you a little. But I'm doing that because I don't want you to wait until it's too late to set the example, to be the spiritual leader that can make a difference in your home. So the first thing we learned from Adam is don't hide from God. Here's the second thing. Being present isn't enough. Look, look back at verse 6. And I think in verse 6 we can actually begin to see why Adam gets the blame for what happened. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What you may not have known about this story is Adam was right there. He watched all of this go down, and he didn't say what he needed to say. He didn't do what he needed to do. This is the first sin of inaction. Before Eve even took a bite of the forbidden fruit, Adam watched Satan attack his family, and he didn't do anything. Adam couldn't get up out of the recliner. He couldn't put down the video game controller long enough to realize that Satan was attacking his wife. And if you go back one chapter to Genesis chapter 2, you see that God gave Adam the command not to eat the forbidden fruit. Didn't give it to Eve. In fact, God gave Adam this command before Eve was, Eve was even created. So Adam had one responsibility, one job for his family to make sure that he didn't break that one rule. And he watched as Satan tore his family apart. There's a part of me that wants to defend Adam here. I want to say, look, maybe, maybe Adam didn't act because he didn't know how dangerous Satan was. Maybe, maybe he didn't act because he didn't realize that there was a spiritual battle going on for his own family. Maybe that's why. And, and maybe, guys, today we don't say what we need to say because we don't realize how powerful Satan is. 
Maybe we don't do what we're supposed to do because we don't realize that there's a spiritual battle going on for the hearts and souls of our wife and our kids. The Bible is very clear that the battle is not flesh and blood. It's not people. The battle is with the spiritual forces of evil. Listen to how Jesus says this in John 10.10. He says, the thief, and he's talking about Satan here, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He's saying, Satan is coming, and he's going to try to steal the souls of your children. He's going to try to kill the holiness of your wife. He's going to try to destroy the love and intimacy in your marriage. That's what he's up to. And do you know what Satan needs from us as men to do that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He needs us to sit idly by while he tries to tempt our children with the sins of this world. He he needs us to do nothing while he tears down the holiness of our wives and destroys our marriage. He needs us to be so distracted by work and hobbies, video games, all the stuff that we've got going on that we even fail to realize what he's doing in our families until it's too late. Several years ago, I read a book called The Demise of Guys Guys, that talks about why it is that men are becoming more and more distracted and more and more disengaged from their families. And it actually places a lot of the blame for this on the addictions to video games and pornography. Now, let me be very, very clear. The book wasn't saying that playing video games is a sin. It's not. Pornography and video games are very different. Pornography is a sin all in and of itself. But what the book is saying is that these two are connected. The addiction is connected. And here's why. Because we are first called to be men of action and men of adventure. That's where video games come in. We're also called to fight for love and intimacy. That's where pornography comes in. And and so instead of seeking out those things in the real world the way God intended we begin to seek them out in a virtual world. See, a video game, it gives us the illusion of being men of action. It gives us the illusion of being heroes. All the while, we're playing games like little boys. We can't be a sports hero in the real world. We can't be a war hero in the real world. And so we sit and we play the the games. Look, I'm not picking on guys that play video games. I, I play some video games on my iPhone and my iPad. But here's what I'm saying. When you sit for hours, men, playing video games, while you have a wife that's starving for communication, starving for love and intimacy, starving to have you help her with the children and help her around the house, you're abdicating your role as being a hero in your own home. When you play video games, all the while Satan is attacking your children and tempting them, and they're upstairs doing things that you know they're doing, and you take no action, you've given up that role. You've substituted an illusion world a fake world for the real world. And then what video games are to men being called to be men of action and adventure, pornography is the same to love and intimacy. We are called to fight for love and intimacy the way God intended with our wives. We're we're, we're called to, to win the heart of our wives, to treat her like the daughter of the king that she is, to fight for our marriage. And we find love and intimacy through that process of being a hero. And yet we've given that up for the illusion of love and intimacy that we find on some video clips or some pictures. But pornography is a lie of Satan. It's a forbidden fruit. It makes these big promises that it cannot deliver. It promises intimacy, but it delivers isolation. It promises satisfaction, but it delivers emptiness and loneliness. And so many men now are finding satisfaction in the illusion of being men of adventure and men of intimacy in a fantasy world rather than the real world. See, Adam was right there when his wife was tempted by Satan. He he didn't say what he needed to say. He, He didn't do what he needed to do. The sin of passivity, the sin of inaction isn't about what we say. It's about what we fail to say. It's not about what we do, it's about what we fail to do. We can be present in our own homes and still be completely absent. And Adam's not the only man in the Bible that makes this mistake. The the Bible has lots of stories about husbands and fathers and men who sat idly by while their families were attacked and destroyed. 
filled with it. You, you may have heard the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. It's the technicolor dream coat guy. Joseph has lots of brothers, but Joseph was his father's favorite. And the father would, you know, give him all kind of gifts, and the brothers started getting angry about that. They became jealous. They got more and more angry until they hated Joseph. Eventually, they would kidnap him and sell him into slavery. But what you may not know about that story is that the dad knew all of this was happening before it got out of control. But he didn't do anything. Look at Genesis 37, 11. This is talking about the brothers here. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. His father knew about it, but he didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. He thought about it, but he never got around to it. And it tore his family apart. You may have heard of Eli from the Old Testament. He was the, the Jewish high priest in the temple. And his sons were stealing the offerings that people gave to the temple. They were also sleeping with the women that were serving in the temple. And Eli knows about this. And God commands Eli to confront his sons and to take action to stop what they were doing. But Eli doesn't say what he needs to say. He doesn't do what he needs to do. And eventually, this is God here talking about Eli in 1 Samuel 3.13. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. A sin of inaction. There it is again. We see it throughout the Bible. What's happening? Guys, we're in a war for the hearts and souls of our children and our wives. How will we respond? I've heard it said that the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is indifference. It's sitting there watching while bad stuff happens. We're called to rise up and do something. We're called to be men of courage. We're called to lead, encourage, love, discipline, and to fight for our families. Some of you guys are in a marriage that's really struggling, and you know it. You see what's going down, and the question is, will you say what needs to be said? Will you do what needs to be done? You need to take action. God will restore your marriage if you step up as men and do what God has called you to do. Remember I said the first week that I was going to challenge some of you the last week to start over. That some, of you marriage, some of your marriages are so messed up that you don't need to continue the way you are. You need to start over with your spouse. And that's why my challenge today is for men. Some of you men need to ask your wives to marry you all over again. You, you need to renew your vows and recommit to the promises that you made. Maybe it was two years ago. Maybe it was 20 years ago. But you need to ask your wife to marry you all over again and start over. Maybe that vow renewal is just an intimate moment with your wife in a restaurant or in a park somewhere. Maybe you invite some friends over to the house to kind of celebrate that moment with you as you renew your promises before God. If you'd like one of our pastors to do a vow renewal ceremony, we'd love to do that. You can just stop by the Connect booth on the way out, tell Adam you'd like to talk to somebody about that. You can also just put it on that little connect card that you'd like to do that. Guys, don't sit back and watch Satan destroy your marriage. Step up and be the hero and the spiritual leader God's called you to be. So we've learned not to hide from God. We've learned that being present isn't the same as being involved. And here's the last thing. Excuses aren't an excuse. Let's look at what Adam does. This is uh, Genesis 3, verses 11 and 12. God says... Have you eaten from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. You love what Adam does here. He says, look, you put the woman here, and then she gave me some fruit, and yeah, I ate it. He turns himself into the victim. He blames God, he blames his wife, and he tries to make himself the victim. Rather than taking responsibility for his own leadership failure, he makes excuses. And so often, we do the exact same thing. Guys, you may have reasons that you're not being the spiritual leader of your own home. Maybe the reason is your dad was a horrible example for you. He never showed you what it looks like to be the man God's called you to be, the husband God's called you to be, the father God's called you to be. But that's not an excuse. Maybe your dad was absent, just never there. Maybe your dad was around, he was present, but he was always so involved with work and different hobbies that he really never took the time to say what needed to be said and do what needed to be said. Maybe you were, you know, in a football game and you caught the winning touchdown and you looked up to see your dad 
and he wasn't there. Or you took the big basket at the end of the game and your dad wasn't there. Or the spelling bee, whatever it was, and your dad was just never there. He didn't set the example. You were desperately waiting for your dad to tell you he was proud of you and he loved you. But he never did that. But that's not an excuse. And you need to understand the sin of passivity isn't new. It didn't start with your dad. It didn't start with your granddad. It started with Adam. And then for thousands of years, men have sat by idly while Satan attacks their home. You know, one of the famous recliners that we sit in is called what? A lazy boy. Not called a lazy girl. It's called a lazy boy. And there's a reason for that. We may work really hard at work, but then we get home and so often we're really lazy about our mission of being a leader. Here's another excuse. Some of you would say, well, you know, I don't really need to do that because my wife, she's the spiritual leader of our, our home. She's the one that teaches our kids about the Bible and teaches them how to pray and takes them to church. So I don't really need to, to worry about that. We saw earlier how important it is that you take the lead on those roles. That's not an excuse. She probably takes the lead because you haven't. And I bet most of your wives would be thrilled if you stepped up and became the spiritual leader of your own home. They would find you more attractive and more desirable than they ever have before. Some of you guys, you may have a wife that's difficult to take that role. She likes that role. And it makes it very hard. Some of you may even have a wife that criticizes you for all your mistakes and makes fun of you when you try to lead and says you don't have what it takes. That's tough. But overcoming obstacles is a part of leadership, right? We can, we can make excuses or we can overcome obstacles. That's what we call to as men. That's why we love video games about battle. That's why we love sports, right? It's everything is down. It's the fourth quarter. You're down by 10 points. And what does the leader do? He comes from behind. He overcomes the obstacles and he wins. That's the calling that we have as men. Do something. Have a conversation with your wife in love and tell her what you've been called to do. Ask her to encourage you and to give you some slack and to be patient with you as you try to learn to be the spiritual leader God's called you to be. So here are some practical ways that I want to give you to grow in being the spiritual leader of your home. Here's the first one. Some of you guys may not want to be here today. Some of you guys may have had a fight with your wife this morning or last night about whether or not you were going to go to church today. And you're constantly finding reasons that you don't want to go to church. That's an easy change for you. You be the one on Saturday night to talk about church in the morning and get everybody up. You be the one to talk about joining a community group rather than being the one that says you don't have time and you don't want to do it. Be the spiritual leader in your home. You can also pray for your family. You can pray for your wife and your kids, and then you can tell them that you prayed for them. Or or better yet, you can pray for your wife and your kids with them there, and they can see you growing in your relationship with God. Now, it'll be uncomfortable the first time you do it, but the good news is there's no magic words. You don't have to say the exact right thing. It's all about your desire to lead. Your family will see that. Read the Bible with your wife, or just sit at the kitchen table in the morning or the evening and read the Bible and let your family see you growing in relationship with Jesus. And if you do those things, the odds are pretty good that they're going to follow Ladies, can I talk to you for just a minute? You play a critical role in your husband's success or failure of being the spiritual leader. The more you encourage him and support him and give him some slack when he messes up, the more he realizes he's winning. He's going to want to keep doing it to please you. But if you criticize him constantly, if you tear him down, if you joke about his leadership failures, if you talk bad about him behind his back when he tries to lead, He's going to go right back to what he was doing before. Remember a verse we looked at from Proverbs a couple of weeks ago? This is Proverbs 21.9. It says, it's better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Ladies, if you constantly criticize your husband, you're going to send him right back to the corner of the roof, to his video games, to his fantasy football team, to all of his hobbies. But when you encourage and you support him, he's going to want to please you. He's going to want to be the leader that he's called to be. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came to the garden looking for Adam. It it didn't matter that Eve was certainly partially responsible. And, And make no mistake, Eve was punished for her sin. And your wives and your children 
They'll be punished for their decisions in following Jesus. But guys, the buck stops with us. We are called to be heroes. We are called to be the spiritual leaders of our home and to take our families to church, to teach them what it looks like to follow Jesus. That's who we were made to be. And so the question is, will we do it? Because ultimately, we're going to answer to God. And God's not going to care what our high score was in Age of Warcraft. I don't know what the modern games are, whatever it is. He's not going to care about how much money we made or how successful we were. He's not going to care how many fantasy football championships I've won. He's going to care, were you a man of action? Did you love your wife like Christ loved the church? Did you lead the way that you're called to lead? Did we rise up and make a difference in our marriage, in our church, and in our world? Do you remember the movie, The Patriot? Anybody remember that? Yeah, with Mel Gibson, if you remember correctly, it's about the American Revolution. Uh, Mel Gibson's character had been a a soldier in in wars past, and he didn't get involved because he knew how difficult it was to, to fight a war. And so he stays on the sideline, and and the war with the British keeps getting closer and closer to home. Eventually, it begins to hurt his family and hurt his community. And at one point in the movie, there's a battle being fought literally in his backyard. And he's standing on the back porch with his wife, watching this battle rage that he's not involved in. And he becomes very convicted about his failure to take action. And, And his wife tries to console him. She says, you've done nothing wrong. And he pushes back and he says, I've done nothing. And that is wrong. Men, are we going to sit idly by or are we going to be the men of action that God has called us to be? Because if we do that, it will change everything. Let's pray.